We're good to go when you are there, Alexia. Let's stop sharing the screen. All right, perfect. So hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all on the call, as well as those watching our live stream. My name is Alexia, and why I, I am one of the judge and speaker coordinators this for this year's Queen's Entrepreneurs Competition. I will be introducing and moderating the event that we've all been waiting for. The top six QEC teams will pitch their business ideas in front of a new panel of judges for the opportunity to win funding to help launch and grow their business. So I'd like to give a huge thank you to the judges who have joined us today for the competition. Nick and George, our co-chairs, have provided a phenomenal introduction for the judges at the start of our day. However, I'd like to do a quick recap before we go into the pitches. So we are very excited to have John Trang, who is a partner of Persistence Capital Partners, Lisa Kershaw, a managing partner of Boyden Global Executive Search, Prantha Ramesh, the managing director and chief compliance officer of Maple Leaf Angels, Deborah Dobson, a partner at Peloton Capital Management, Anatoly Melnichuk, a prize donor of the QEC and co-founder and former CEO of Snap Saves, which was later acquired by Groupon, and finally, Peter Wilson, a longtime supporter and prize donor of the QEC as well, and the executive chairman of Wilson International Limited. So this group of judges represents incredible experience from all facets of entrepreneurship, from starting their own companies to managing and fun funding other widely su successful companies. We thank them for being here today to share their insight and expertise with this year's competitors. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that each team will deliver a 10 minute pitch which will be followed up by a 20 minute Q&A with the judges. When one minute is left in the pitch, I will turn my camera back on and hold up a sign that will display that one minute is remaining. We request that all microphones are muted as teams pitch their ventures and only the team that is currently presenting should have their cameras on. With that being said, let's get started. So our first team up is Artheka. You're welcome to share your screen and start whenever you're ready. Thank you, yeah, I'll share my screen. I hope you can all see it. Yes, you get to go, Denise. All right, thanks a lot. All right, then welcome to Arteca, your online art library of the future. So let me tell you the story of our emerging artist, Nadine. She just finished art school and all she wants to do is create. And she was really frustrated because first she had no idea where to start and she had absolutely no clue where to find the right customers. And Nadine tried selling some paintings, but it didn't go well. And she even tried to open her own art school and already investing in materials and space. However, as the pandemic hit, all of her efforts were lost. And at the same time now, imagine if you have a restaurant or hotel, you might want to leave a lasting impression on your guests and hang contemporary artworks that go well with the atmosphere and the rest of the interior. And also as a company, you might want to decorate your conference rooms and office with inspiring artworks that not only look good when clients are dropping by, but are also enhancing the well-being of employees. However, you don't know how to communicate with artists and don't want to take care of logistics. So this is where Arteca comes in with our curated library of high quality art from talented emerging and established artists, we help you select and purchase. Plus our tailored all consulting service makes decisions fast and easy. And on top of that, our augmented reality solution helps to visualize artworks in your physical space before purchasing. For artists, we're a sales platform to expose their works and connect them to interested clients. Our vision is to connect every single customer with suitable artists. With Arteca, they can find their own unique artworks that perfectly convey the distinct character of their business. And we want to get inspiring artworks into every office, hotel, waiting room, and restaurant by connecting creators and art lovers and helping them through the process. And through the customer validation we have done, we found that our primary focus customer segment is the B2B market especially for businesses that have a lot of customer contact. Art can be not only a piece of decoration, but also a branding technique and investment. 
And at the same time, customer-centered businesses are also a great venue for artworks by emerging artists as they gain more prominent exposure. And we want to give every artist that has potential a chance and uh, a platform that is not guarded by prestige or high entry costs compared to galleries. The global art market is currently worth over 64 billion US dollars and it has often shown resilience to events in the wider uh, economic and political environment. However, 2020 has presented uh, the gallery sector in particular with some of its biggest challenges yet. And it is forecasted to expand more of its share to online sales in the following years. And to show you the accurate potential of Arteca, we narrowed the market down to certain countries and the proportion of art sales shifting towards online platforms. So we value our SAM at 6.8 billion US dollars. And through our calculation, we are confident to realistically uh, reach a $58 million market share. Speaking of potential, here you can see the possible future growth of the online art market. In uh, 2019, the share of online sales was at a mere 10% and it rose to incredible 37% in the first half of 2020. And um, assuming different scenarios of how the market will evolve, in the best case, um, the transition towards the online art market will keep up the current momentum and reach 27%, while in the realistic and worst case scenario, it will still rise just at a slower pace. And nevertheless, this shift will definitely occur and believe, uh, we believe that Arteca is in the middle of a market disruption. We are currently signing partnerships with interior designers and other institutions so we can benefit through their existing customer base which will give us and our artists exposure. And at the same time, we provide them with high quality curated art and 3D models that they can use in their own designs. And through this, we will gain reputation fast um, and can then benefit from existing connections and network effects. There are some online competitors on the market already, proving the potential for our business. Um, at the moment, however, our greatest competitors volume wise are still offline galleries. And we can compete with our focus on digital technologies and AR and by forming partnerships with other players in the fine arts sector, such as set before interior designers and art schools. And we have our selected network of artists. Um, also our special focus on B2B customers and their needs gives us an unfair advantage over our competitors. And our website is already online at arteca.at where we already have the first artworks that will be up for sale. Um, by the way, you can find Nadine's paintings there as well. And you can already filter them, read about the artist's stories and book our consulting service. And we're currently working on the implementation of our augmented reality feature that allows to place the artwork on your wall um, and next to the rest of the interior. Our current financial forecast will be achieved by expanding our business to major art markets like the US and the UK. And our main revenue stream is the commission of 30%. We charge on the sales of art and we will gain it by increasing our emerging artist sales, by closing partnerships with additional institutions, um, as well as by acquiring more established artists. And realistically, sales will rise to over 17,000 artworks a year in 2025 reaching 12.8 million US dollars of revenue. And this is already based on our 30% commission. And in addition to that, we plan to employ up to 24 new employees in the area of technical development, sales, art expertise, and finance specialists. And these expansions will lead up to $4.4 million of costs in 2025, but we'll still be ending the year on a positive cash flow of 8.4 million US dollars. And we have started our journey in an applied university course at the Vienna University of Economics and Business in Austria. And through the lean startup method, we have tested hypotheses and pivoted towards what Arteca is now. And we have also won the prize for the best bachelor's pitch. And the VU Entrepreneurship Center has offered us to be part of their mentoring program called Startup Leap where we are getting regular coachings with experts from the Austrian startups ecosystem already since three months. 
and that's our roadmap for the next months. So we plan to launch in March and start acquiring artists as well as close further partnerships to secure sales. And we want to implement the augmented reality tool in April and do lots of customer testing to achieve product market fit. While our goal by the end of the year is to have sold over 1000 paintings. And after we launch, we plan to first expand within Austria, since that's where we're based, and the German-speaking region later to the whole EU, targeting the UK as an appealing market, as well as the United States, and eventually take over the entire art world. And in order to achieve this goal, we want to raise um, 220,000 US dollars in our pre-seed round in order to cover all operational expenses to found Arteca and be able to go to market as soon as possible, since the art market has disruptive potential and we know how important timing is in such cases. And um, most of our investment will be used to scale our business. Um, we will do vigorous customer testing regarding our platform and the AR tool, as well as marketing, and we want to grow fast. I'm proud to present you our ambitious and diverse team. We're based in Vienna, Austria. I'm Denise, the founder, and I have gained international startup experience in Japan with another sustainable business idea, and I've worked in B2B sales for a software startup. I also speak five languages, and I was in charge of HR recruiting talents for the portfolio startups of one of the biggest European VCs. And Maciej is the COO and CFO, and he has profound experience with social media marketing, as he has already built two successful Instagram pages, reaching about 1.5 million views per week. And he's also the brand ambassador of the wider known Aphorix magazine. It's a business magazine. And Machi has already founded his first company, Be Motivation, and he gained knowledge in finance, legal advice, marketing, sales, and networking. And not to forget our head of technical development, Olena, who is an architect and also studied in art school. And her professional skills in design, in 3D modeling and augmented, as well as virtual reality, are making her our main talent in charge of our product. So together we're on our way to disrupt the art market. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Arteca. Um, we can now move to Q&A with the judges. I'd love to jump in if you don't mind. Um, hi, Denise, great presentation. I Thank have you. several questions in my mind, but I'll just limit it to one in the interest of time. Um, so the way I understand it, you're offering a tool um, where people can essentially input their interests and what their needs might be in terms of artwork, and then you're able to provide um, recommendations, or is it merely a marketplace where, you know, I can go on and browse, because uh, I did go to the website, and, um, and it seemed that way, but perhaps it's a work in progress. The reason for that question is, um, you know, when you were talking about connecting art lovers with emerging artists. Um, I'm trying to hone in on who your target customer is with be it a corporate setting, be it a restaurant, be it a hotel. I think they all operate quite differently. And I'm looking to understand how much you really understood the needs of your target client. So we have done a lot of customer testing um, during our course, especially and also ongoing. And um, as you said, first, of course, B2B is our main segment. We have also included B2C previously, but we found out that B2B, especially now um, in the time of the pandemic, most um, are using this time of closed restaurants and closed hotels to revamp their interior. So they're trying to get new designs to their, um, to their premises. And this is where they found it difficult because um, some high-end hotels might have other needs, obviously, as um, a cafe at the corner. But we found that most want to have a special customer experience. So they want to have like a personalized approach towards this. And if you go to an online platform, you can just drop your, your liked paintings into the, um, like you can just buy them there, but you won't get consulting. So since some are not that art um, savvy, we can help them to figure out what goes well with their interior and where they might um, need some more help with this. 
You're wonderful. Denise. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, John, it'll be super quick. Um, do you, how would you respond if someone like Asachi decided to create an online tool uh, to do exactly that as a result of COVID? You know, obviously it, it's a no brainer to move digitally. So the thing um, about our competitors, Saatchi um, has a, his platform as well. It's called Saatchi Art, and they indeed are a competitor of ours. However, um, they are not focusing on the needs of B2B clients. So I think from all of our competitors that we have seen, no one is doing that specifically now. Um, and this is where we want to get our competitive advantage. Denise had a quick, oh, I think it can totally hear. Uh, I was muted. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, just following on, on Pasna's question, um, just trying to understand kind of your target customers, because B2B, but, you know, there's lots of different parts of that, right? And is every piece of art on your on your platform individual and unique? Yeah, definitely. So we are currently focusing on mostly contemporary, but as we're growing, we want to give every artist a chance that might also have different styles. Yes. Uh, I, I happen to have a friend who was an artist who's had a part-time job. His job was to recreate other paintings and change it just enough so they didn't get in trouble, right? But then mass produce it for higher end hotels, but not hotels that are unique and instant. Right. So how do you get to like when you're selling B2B, is every sale an individual sale or how do you get to more of that scale if you're selling to like, you know, a Marriott group who has both high end hotels and low end hotels? Like, like what, what is the how do you serve those customers? Yeah, I think it's definitely a very big thing to have unique artworks in your hotels, wherever it is, even if Marriott Group has many different hotels all around the world, I think that every single branch can distinctly um, like dis distinguish themselves from the others by having unique art because every single branch is in a different location, even if it's in the same town. So I think that it's also very important to keep the artists in mind because as you said, yeah, most are trying to copy the style or the exact painting sometimes. Um, but we want to actually be this platform for artists that they can have their own works on it. So original works of them. Um, so have you guys done any analysis of, you know, what it'll cost you to sign up a business to, to use your service? What, you know, what it'll cost you to source art? Like, what is your cost of customer acquisition, both on the art piece side, on the, um, you know, business side? And, you know, if you're offering kind of like that, white glove service that kind of concierge it's kind of back to a drama saying you know how scalable is that and what are your unit economics in, in this because i think that you know what you know kind of thinking this through it seems really nice and i think that a lot of companies would benefit from that I mean, i'd love to have someone kind of find my art for me but how much is that worth to me how much would i pay for that versus going on like a satch you or you know you you gallery or in the states there's a lot more competitors who kind of have custom unique art or just going, like John was saying, to you know an Asian manufacturer who can crank out oil paintings, you know, thousands a week, right? With amazing, amazing artists. So I'll pass the cost question on to Machi. He's our finance guy. Yeah, uh, from the cost perspective, we have nego either negotiated already the cost that will occur uh, during the co the including of the AR service into our platform. Uh, we have also talked already with logistic companies, how much uh, would it cost to sh ship into different countries. That's why we also decided to stay within Austria, Switzerland and Germany within the first year. And um, there was a lot of questions. Um, did I understand it right? How do we get those artists to well, our platform? What, what, are the, what are the numbers? Like, have you done the, the calc? Like how much will it cost you to find the business how much will it cost you to find the artist like, mm -hmm. versus how much you're paying the actual curator like what are the unit economics and have you okay. done your profitability uh and yes so the second part was and then how will you compete with that where you know you could go find like john was saying um kind of artists who will mass produce amazing art for you mm -hmm. uh, so regarding the artist side uh, we are contacting them through instagram uh, so we are getting into a personal talk with them. What is their story? Why are they started painting? And we are trying to acquire them onto our platform. And what we have 
seen at the beginning stages of our company that every artist that we contacted is interested in joining our platform because there are a lot of artists that don't sell their paintings because the current art market is working like um, you're going to a get when you are lucky you're getting a contract with a gallery the gallery is selling your paintings where where and they are getting 50 percent of commission for that and if you send a long your contract you you can go down to 35 percent we at arteca offer only 30 percent commission uh, fee to our end customer to so to b2b so we are cheaper than uh, let's say an actual uh, artist um, expert who is searching for the art and also want uh, a specific amount of money for his service. Um, so we are definitely cheaper than the competition and we offer more value for that. And we can scale our business through new employees, new sales personnel. And we also will have sales experts in the different countries like US, UK, when we start expanding, because we know that different markets uh, require different needs. And you have to also know about how to get in contact with specific, uh, with this, specific uh, kind of um, uh, people because every country has a different mindset and that is how you want to scale the business. Mm -hmm. Can I I'd just like to ask a follow on question. I first of all, I thought your opening was really compelling and I thought it was a really great storyline. Uh, so congrats to that. My question, I just want to probe in two areas. So one is, is the consulting a separate revenue stream? Is that a separate service I purchase and I could maybe purchase the paintings or not? So, No, consulting is included. Um, since we want to get give the B2B customers the full experience, we want to take care of everything. Okay. And most of the time right now it is like this, you get an art advisor that then gets the art at a dealer and you have the dealer premium and you have the art advisor premium, but we do all of this in 30%. Okay. And then my second question is back to logistics and just, and, and it was partially answered, but if you've ever shipped art, which I have a little bit, it's extremely expensive um, yeah. and particularly on a one-off basis. And so I guess short-term, I'm understanding geographically, you're focusing Austria, Switzerland, somewhere else you said, but I'm wondering long-term, what is the plan? And I could imagine, and we've got a, our logistics guy here, but I could imagine that those costs, like the supply chain costs could outweigh the actual art itself and so just what long-term plan do you have geographically and how how do you ensure that the cost of the actual transportation of the product doesn't eat up all your profits basically and at the beginning in austria germany and switzerland we have already talked with different um, uh, logistic companies and at the moment the costs are pretty cheap for selling art because you're selling um emerging artists at the moment, uh, whereas so companies like they had are also interested into the shipping process. But when the artwork gets more costly, we obviously have to um, package it differently and send it with different companies who, where we really can rely on that they will bring it to the customer safely and without any damage. Uh, so therefore we also, we are for sure have a higher insurance costs. So, but we for sure will make insurance contracts we have already also an expert. Um, we talked with an expert about that. And yeah, regarding scaling, we at the beginning, um, in the second year, we try to, we want to scale to the UK and the USA. And in the USA, we will mostly focus on American artists. So the shipping process will be from America to America. And let's say someone from America wants an artwork that he really wants to have at his office from Europe then he has to pay the additional transportage costs. Thank you. How do you, um, so thank you for the presentation. I, I quite enjoyed it. Um, I, I hear one side of the pandemic question being answered, um, which in my head is more people are buying digitally. So creating a marketplace that people could go and look and, and uh, uh, see how that product will fit into their workspace and so forth. Um, I, I hear that answer, but the flip side to that is what's happening to your customer. So I haven't been in my office in six months and I'm probably never going back. Um, we're looking at all of our foot footprints and considering how they shrink because we're not going to have the, the same footprint anymore, right? Maybe half the people are working from an office at various times. Uh, you know, I've got a friend uh, in the hotel business 
uh, you know, where he's got 20% occupancy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, on one side, I hear the, the potential opportunity. Uh, my question is around on the client side, on the, on the, on the B2B or, you know, business hotel, whatever you want to call it. Uh, how is that dynamic changing given the market we're in right now? So you definitely have a point with the offices. More, more people are starting to work remotely, but that is not our only B2B income stream. So as soon as everything opens up, for sure, many more people will take the chance to travel because they've been missing this for over a year now. Um, more people will be in hotels, more people will be going out, um, get some food at specific restaurants. And I think that if offices that are interested, we can obviously serve them with our artworks. Um, but especially now after the pandemic is opening up, um, more customer center businesses like waiting rooms um, or yeah, even doctor's offices, we have gotten really good feedback and they have very lot, a lot of client contact at the moment. Hi, thanks for the presentation, it's Deborah. Uh, Denise, this is a question, I think back to scale, a couple questions, but one around scalability. As you move geographically, have you thought two questions, one around your tech and what it requires for language requirements or how you guys are going to make that um, affordable as you guys scale and enter new, enter new countries and geographies. And secondly, same, same thinking with your team, whomever is supporting both on the artist side, acquisition side, as well as the brokering side, making the marriage. Have you guys thought about how you can scale up knowing, uh, knowing you're dealing with different geographies and different needs? Mm -hmm. Concerning technology, Elena can for sure answer the question. Mm, uh, yeah, the, I mean, um, can you repeat the question again? Because uh, I have not stable internet connection. And... It's okay, Elena. Thanks for the presentation. As you move into the technology question is, as you move yeah. into the geographies, you'll mm -hmm. have different requirements, be it language requirements. Yeah. Uh, you can go around the whole tech stack and what you might need to do differently in the different geographies. So just a question in terms of have you guys considered what that is, what, what the requirements uh, are? Yeah, we, we created a website page on German language, which will be oriented on German market. We also have the main page in English. We can translate it in Russian as well. And I think in Italian and yeah. So I think it's enough for now. For later steps, we can uh, hire some people that we can translate as well. Yeah, I already mentioned this question kind of at the beginning. Uh, as already said, uh, when we will expand to countries like uh, British, okay, British countries are English, but uh, let's say France or Italy. Uh, we'll obviously acquire also sales personnel in these stages. So um, our consulting will be in the specific language because we have sales personnel in the specific language. And the websites um, can, we will obviously have to acquire a translator who will help us with the current paintings or also rely on uh, yeah, specific person in a specific person in this area. So additional personal we have to bring into the team. Mm -hmm. um, I had one question. I, I don't know if you guys can pull this up, but I, I was looking at the financial chart that you put up and I was a little confused with where the, where the numbers were coming from. Um, I don't know if you can pull that, pull that chart back up or not, but. Yeah. Denise, so, can you show the presentation? Yes. Um, yeah, maybe turn it again. You mean the last, the investment slide or the- There, there was a bar, like a, that, that chart here. Mm -hmm. are, are those numbers on the end, the 2025 numbers? Yes. Mm -hmm. And if I'm reading this correctly, blue is revenue. This is a 12.4 in revenue. Yep. And yellow is EBITDA. So does that say 12.8 in EBITDA? Uh, yeah. So this is the cash and bank that we have. Um, cash and bank at the end of the year 2025. Okay. Um, I'm a little, I'm a little confused as to how revenue, like 
revenue minus cost might equal EBITDA depending on kind of what's in between. So I'm a little confused on how EBITDA can be higher than revenue and and how that chart's reading. Can can you clarify? I guess can you walk me through how that chart reads? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so at the beginning, it will uh, make less revenue than costs within the first uh, within the first two years. Uh, we become cash flow positive from the year 2023 on. You can see the yellow um, chart uh, about how our, our current financial status um, uh, will be. And yeah, I think we have an error in 2025, what I see. Yeah, sorry for that mistake, we'll correct it. And can you- Do you have the number off the top of, the top yeah, of your head? Swap. Like, it, 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 like Yeah, uh, it, the numbers are swapped. Uh, so the 12.8 mm -hmm. million has mm -hmm. to be at the blue chart and 2.12.3 million has to be at the yellow. So just just in general, what, like um, just ignore the numbers here. Like what, mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your gross margin and EBITDA margin gonna be at run rate? Uh, at the beginning or you no know, like when you get to kind of steady state where you want to get to like what do you think your margin what your margins are going to be okay um so margins uh will be uh for the first year we plan to sell paintings which will get us an uh, a revenue of around 180 dollars per painting in the second year 300 dollars per painting and rising to 2025 to 650 dollars per painting and uh, with rising worth of the artworks we obviously the revenue will be higher even though uh, let's say between 2024 and 2025 uh, we don't sell twice as many artworks but we make nearly twice as much revenue uh, by selling more value per art and, and from also already more established artists yeah, and we have already also taken into the consideration the shipment costs. So the shipments are all because we made an assumption that we will sell so many and so many, so many paintings in different areas. And we have already calculated the specific shipping costs to specific areas. So um, all the revenues that are made in the US are um, um, calculated with those numbers, logistic costs to transport it to the US. Thank you. Perfect. I think that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you, Arteca, and thank you, judges, for your. Uh, are we ready to go? Yep, you can start whenever. Awesome. Hi, everyone. So I became intimately aware of the life altering effects of nighttime hot flashes through my mom, Flavia. Hot flashes are sudden, intense feelings of warmth, often described as internal burning sensations. They can strike at any time and they severely disrupt ordinary activities. My mom's experienced significant disruptions due to hot flashes and has spent thousands of dollars in search of relief, but found little relief. Talking to hundreds of other women, I found that she's not alone. We've talked to women that have had to quit their jobs due to the constant state of exhaustion and who report constant fatigue and lack of control. For many women, menopausal hot flashes take sleep deprivation to the next level. Almost all women will be regularly woken up by them, and these disruptions can occur up to a dozen times a night, leaving them with only a few hours of sleep for seven and a half years on average. The perpetual sleep deprivation from hot flashes can cause profound distress and change the way women work and live their daily lives. On average, a woman suffering, suffering from regular hot flashes loses about three hours of sleep per week. There are 42 million women in the United States suffering from hot flashes. Initially, we're going to target women entering menopause with a minimum household income of $100,000 and who experience moderate to severe hot flashes at least twice a week, making up a $9.8 billion addressable market. Today, a lack of viable solutions leaves women grasping at poorly researched or ineffective solutions. Women we've spoken to have resorted to hormone treatments that elevate cancer risk, herbal remedies with little to no scientific backing, and generic cooling hardware products that simply aren't built to solve this problem. We are changing this harsh reality. We are building Aura Blue, the first product that actually predicts hot flashes and counteracts sleep disruptions. 
our patent pending sensor bracelet can detect hot flashes over a minute before women wake. Once a hot flash is detected, our sensor bracelet communicates via Bluetooth with our smart cooling hub, which then pumps pre-cooled water through a mattress pad under the woman's sheets. This enables our cooling mattress pad to bring a woman's temperature back in balance before she feels a hot flash. Our one-of-a-kind sensor bracelet is worn on the wrist where it collects key biometric data. We've already proven this system with our prototype sensors. This is an example of actual data that allows us to see a hot flash minutes before it truly sets in. Here you can see pre and post uh, data from our, Aura Blue hot, from our Aura Blue hot flash sensor device. Um, the orange line shows the intensity of the hot flash without Aura Blue. We see a stronger spike and a longer time before the woman can recover. With the blue line, with Aura Blue, you see we catch the hot flash early and are able to return the woman to, uh, back to a normal temperature a lot sooner. Aura Blue, women love Aura Blue be because it's dynamic. It learns from the data it gathers each night, increasing performance and personalization over time. It has manual inputs, which allow the user to teach the system, and it uses its sensors to collect sleep metrics, which provide insight into the user's sleep cycles. Aura Blue remain, maintains users' ideal sleeping temperatures, keeping them asleep all night long. So far, we've developed early alpha prototypes of both our sensor and cooling system. Here, you can see the progression of our sensor bracelet and then our cooling system on the right. So far, we've tested with 11 women, documenting 40 known hot flash events and running four full system cooling tests. We've gotten great feedback along the way that we've incorporated into our alpha design. After one of our full system, after using one of our full system prototypes for the first time, one woman recounted, during my hot flash, I almost felt cold. It was beautiful. While there are other solutions on the market, none parallel Aura Blue's predictive cooling abilities. Our product stands out from existing cooling products for three reasons, the prediction, the response, and the speed. To relieve the sleep disruption for a typical five minute hot flash, it is critical to see it coming and respond before the user wakes up. No other product comes close to this. Our competitors, just maintain a preset temperature throughout the night. Women end up too cold to fall asleep, yet too hot during a hot flash. Our innovative prediction and sensing enables us to provide the perfect sleep temperature response at each moment during the night. After conducting advertising experiments on Facebook and interviewing women about their purchasing habits with regards to menopause, we have decided to pursue a direct to consumer, uh, pursue direct to consumer sales through our website. Because women most often discuss menopause solutions with their friends, we intend to promote ourselves with easy to share articles, as well as digital advertising and partnerships with major voices in the menopause and femtech communities. While running our first three week ad campaign in August, we received 60 waitlist signups on our website through Facebook ads. Our upfront price for Aura Blue is $649, just under average for other in-bed cooling devices. We have spoken to the women in our network and run advertising experiments and pricing surveys to confirm that the majority of, of women we talked to would be willing to pay $649 for true hot flash relief. In addition, we are developing a tiered premium suite of sleep tracking and analytics features, such as active suggestions for sleep improvement that will be offered as a subscription service um, priced at $5 a month after a free trial period with a higher tier with more personalized feedback at $8 a month. 
with that, assuming that the average customer uses Aura Blue for seven and a half years and maintains the basic subscription for that time span, our average customer's lifetime value is $1,078. We intend to manufacture 50 beta products per month by October 2021. To reach that goal, we need to finalize our alpha design, which is the first version of our prototype to incorporate a fully custom PCB and miniaturized wrist sensor. We are close to finalizing that design and we plan to finish it by February. From there, we'll use a spring to run our alpha tests for a final round of sensor verification before focusing on beta production. We will begin our marketing efforts and file our full non-provisional patent in June before our beta launch in August. We plan on becoming cash flow positive by 2022. By 2026, we aim to sell to 5% of women in the US beginning to experience hot flashes. Capturing 5% of our beachhead market will generate around $76 million in annual revenue. This is a constantly replenishing market since every year new women enter menopause. Looking long-term, once we've gained a comfortable market share in the US, we will expand to international markets. We'll channel these profits into R&D to expand our product line to adjacent sleep aid products. In the long-term, we aim to be a strong competitor in the $85 billion sleep aid market. And here's a rough estimate of how we aim to spend our money in the next four months and uh, where we would channel you know, the QEC prize money into. We're going to spend about $14,000 to fund our non-provisional patent, $12,000 to pay our team, $12,000 for prototyping hardware, and $5,000 for testing and business expenses. We're privileged to have a team that combines strong engineering, business, and industry experience. As recent graduates from the Mechanical Engineering, Computer Science, and School of Management departments at MIT, we collectively have the technical and entrepreneurship experience to bring this product and the ones to follow to women who need it most. Our ultimate goal is to have our sleeping environments respond to unique needs at every stage of sleep so that women like my mom can get the sleep they deserve, transforming sleep as we know it. Thank you, and at this time, we'll take questions. Kudos to the team on the thoroughness of, you know, thinking through various elements. I think that was quite well done. Um, I want to just ask a little bit about that one instance you had where you had a lady actually say she felt colder um, during her hot flash than she would have expected. So if, you're, if your objective is to minimize sleep disturbance, um, doesn't moderating the temperature actually serve better rather than immediate cold that one might feel right away? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, that is something we're trying to perfect um, kind of through our testing. So that would be uh, the ideal goal. Um, and it's something we're continuously working through uh, or working towards, yeah. Okay, because I had understood that that was maybe one of your competitive differentiators as opposed to some of the existing smart mattresses, which will just um, sort of, they won't do, uh, Speed, they won't give you cold immediately, but rather over time, you'll gradually feel the benefits. Yeah, yeah, um, that is, and that is what what we're working towards is to be able to have the kind of response there. Now, the problem is that we're facing is that it's like, it's kind of complex. Um, and that's why we're incorporating kind of our machine learning algorithms um, and stuff like that. So it's a process that will get better over time. And as we're gathering more data and more feedback like that from women is getting better. Um, but yes, that's the ultimate goal. And when we take a look at how the competitors do it, so the competitors take roughly 20 to 30 minutes to cool down and the standard hot flash only lasts five minutes. And um, we have a window of one minute to cool them down before they wake up. So it does have to be a little bit abrupt um, but we're working on how we can like strike that balance and being just enough to relieve this extreme heat that they're feeling, um, but not being too abrupt to wake them up. So we'll refine that with future testing. Mm -hmm. right, quick question. How do you minimize, you mentioned in the slide, partner disturbance? Like how do you um, prevent, you know, the partner from waking up because they didn't have a hot flash. So now they're going to be really cold and they'll wake up. Um, great question. Uh, Emilio, do you want to take that? Sure, yeah. So 
we kind of have a, a mattress pad designed for one person. Um, so that allows other people in the, on the, in the bed to, you know, sleep through any disturbance caused by the hot flash. And in fact, be better off with it because now their partner doesn't have to get up and, and change the sheets or change the, the pajamas to account for the sweating. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Cool. Um, and then just, um, does this have to be a bracelet or could it be a ring? I mean, I've got an aura ring and I love it. Um, and, uh, you know, if it is you know, a ring, have you guys thought about partnering with someone who already has a very large market share of wearable sleep aids and potentially integrating with them because they've already spent a lot of a, a lot of money in customer acquisition and potentially just, you know, adding on an extra product or licensing it to them versus building out from scratch? Um, that's a great question. Um, and it has to do with uh, kind of the nature of the sensors we're using. Emilio, do you want to get this one as well? Sure. Yeah. So that's actually um, something we we highly considering. Uh, we we like like we said, our initial platform is a, is a wrist sensor. Um, but the the amazing thing about our sensors is that they like it's a full body response. And so the, the type of although the signals will be a bit different if you were to take like let's say move your the the miniaturized chips to your finger or to your palm, um, it's it's actually it's not too hard to kind of adapt our algorithm to account for that that new signal profile. Um, and so something we've actually been been kind of testing and, and uh, doing doing early early research with our with our uh, women who are, who are going through menopause is seeing actually which like what which um, platform type would be most yeah. comfortable with them and like also how that would affect the entire experience. Yeah. And, and when it comes to, yeah. And when it comes to the partnering, um, no one else is really using like the two facets of sensors that we are deriving the hot flash prediction from. So um, we are unable to partner with them primarily for that reason. And also we think that this could be a large source of future revenue and give us a moat, like an IP production mode. I have a, maybe backing on to Anatoly's questions as well. I mean, your model, if you go back to your financial model, and by the way, you guys have given me something to look forward to. Thank you, Philippe, for that. Uh, that colorful commentary, but if you uh, model it out, um, is it you guys? This is a product. I know you could say it's a system company, but I mean, it looks like you guys are chasing unique IP and unique product around the around the sensor, and then you obviously have you could get a lot of that from a subscription around the software. But knowing that there's so much competitive activity, I guess is my question around bio, you know, about around biometric software, et cetera. And, and you know, there's lots of competitors there. What do you guys fundamentally, what do you think your, your unique position is gonna be in a competitive market? Is that is it the sensor and the hardware, the system, knowing that that subscription software potentially could be at risk with other competitors who are already tracking tracking sleep in other ways? Yeah, Lowen, do you wanna to respond to that? Yeah, so um, we think IP will be our strongest moat in this um, way. The IP is strong enough once we get enough patents built up around us that we can block out any competitors from doing the same thing from that angle. And then additionally, we think that the first mover advantage is actually massive here. These well, ones, you know. Sensor, though, just to be very specific, is that, is that that's what you think your competitive moat is, IP on a sensor? That, yeah, I think that is our strongest competitive moat. And then additionally, once we get out to the market the first, then we can start building the data with the sensor so that we can refine our machine learning models and have like the strongest, most reliable prediction forecasts. And then eventually we think that our brand recognition, like we will be the first, Orbly will be the first name that comes to mind when someone thinks of hot flashes and that eventually from the first mover advantage and the IP production will give us further protection down the line. Can I ask a question about aesthetics? And so there was one slide you had and it showed the device at the end of the bed and it had a bit of a medical hospital vibe attached to it. And so just purely from a superficial aesthetic perspective, what is your long-term intention for what the actual device is gonna look like? Am I looking like I'm in a hospital bed? <laughs> um, or is that gonna a be smaller, more refined? Like, I just feel like there's some opportunity there for that. So what is the long-term intended state of that device to look at? Yeah. Like? So um, this, these are just uh, renders of what we intend to kind of build out. Uh, as our team, as our, as we like continue like designing this device and as our team grows, we are looking, uh, we're a team of five engineers. Uh, so we're looking to bring on some more design expertise. Um, 
if I can just flip for it here. Yeah, uh, so we're, uh, we're, that is something we're actively considering. Thanks for the feedback on that. Yeah, no, it's a great idea. So, <laughs> just a quick question. Like I, I see that you guys have set a price. I don't think I saw you know, where you guys are in terms of your product design versus going and looking to see how much your, um, your manufacturing costs and your supply chain is gonna cost. Like how do you set a price before all those things are set. Have you looked into that yet? Yeah, so we took a twofold pricing approach. So um, the first pricing approach was going out and doing user surveys and figuring out like what is that optimal price point so that um, women have the willingness to pay. And then we took a totally parallel approach at the same time to see if this is viable with what it will actually cost from a manufacturing perspective and from the logistics. Um, from the logistics, what we did is we talked to other startups that have like similar similar packaging um, and shipping needs as us. So that's how we predicted like the shipping costs for manufacturers. We talked to a couple of different manufacturers to get like a baseline estimate of what this might be um, at different levels of scale. And then with that, we ended up with like a 71% gross margin. At what volumes to get to that margin? Yeah, that would be producing like 5,000 um, a year. Hi, sorry if this has already been asked. Um, the sensor bracelet, how long is one meant to wear it? And have you thought about, you know, your target clientele, if there's other smart devices on their wrist, you know, you're, you're fighting for attention, really? Um, yeah. So the smart bracelet is designed to be worn just at night, all night long. Um, so we've been talking to women who do wear sleep trackers at night. Um, and mostly you just like, even if you do have a Fitbit, you only, for who we have talked to, they generally only wear it at night to get sleep data. But because we provide sleep data, uh, we feel like we could be a good replacement for that. Um, and that being said, we have had people who've worn our bracelet and a Fitbit. Um, uh, at the same time, just one on each wrist. Um, yeah. And just to, uh, uh, I guess, to go a little further there. So, are you? Uh, will this integrate with, say, Apple Health, right? So, if you're wearing your Apple Watch and you're using this for sleep and you're you know, wear this as well, could you use that to integrate it to that app for sleep data and all the other stuff that's going on? Or are, are you just trying to maintain it separately within your own, your own uh, app and that sort of stuff? Um, for the time being, we are just maintaining it separately, um, but that could be a future avenue we pursue. Um, yeah, we, uh, we did look into it a bit and it would not be hard to transition it over. It's more a question of like doing a, a, a do focus right now on, you know, getting the system set up. Yeah. So you're looking for funds to file your first patent in the short term. Talk a little bit about what that's gonna cover. Yeah, Lowen, do you wanna talk some about that? Yeah, so um, turns out patents are quite expensive, something that we were not excited to find out. <laughs> um, early prediction looks like it'll cost between $13,000 and $15,000 for a good patent. Um, and then additionally, we are a hardware company. So the majority of the expenses outside of um, the patent will go to hardware prototyping costs. In March, we're hoping to do like a five person trial with our prototype. So we're really wanting to make sure that this is as good as it can be. And that will probably fund this um, initial testing. Sorry, if I answered, if you answered the question on the specifics of what the patent would cover as opposed to the overall approach. As much as you can, if Claire, not- get Claire, you wanna cover that one? Um, what will cover? Okay, so what the patent will cover? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, right now that's something we're still working on with our both our mentors and our lawyers. 
Uh, so right now we're attempting to patent the full system, uh, having a sensor that integrates with a cooling device. Um, yes, that's a liquid cooling device that goes in bed. And have you guys done any IP survey work yet to assess if, if what else is in market or cover? Do you guys think you have a unique position? Yeah, um, some really kind lawyers have like volunteered their time with us and they've helped us perform this search. Um, and yes, it does look like we have a unique position um, and a patent is very viable in this area. Question on me, one other follow up for me is on directed consumer, um, have you looked at acquisition costs there in terms of what it would take to uh, get the eyeballs, get the attention and drive the adoption? Yeah, Claire, yeah. do you wanna pull up the slide? <clears throat> uh, yeah. But Loan, do you wanna take the question? For sure. Um, so what we wanted to do for this is get a baseline estimate on how we can factor this into our cost. So we ran a series of marketing tests to get an estimate of um, what this cost of our customer acquisition cost might be. Um, so from our Facebook and Google ads, we ended up with an $8 and 34, um, $8 cost per waitlist signup. And then we believe this is an early estimate, but we believe 15% will follow through with a purchase, bringing our cost of customer acquisition to $56. Um, we think parts of this will improve over time as we build up some of our reviews and um, the validity from like outside customers to say like, yes, this actually works. So it will be more expensive in the beginning, but as we begin to scale, we think this number will climb down. Just a, just a little comment. I'm, I think it's a very good presentation. You've actually thought through a lot of our kind of questions. I just think that uh, as some feedback, you guys um, are really underestimating your costs. Um, I think you're off by like a factor of 10 on a lot of them, um, including your cost of customer acquisition. Just kind of be mindful of that. Um, and then I think this is like a perfect product for like a Kickstarter campaign where you can actually really test to see what the adoption will be um, before you kind of pile a bunch of money into it, um, yeah. making like a really cool video and just seeing kind of, you know, spend some ad money to see who's willing to pre-buy this and wait. Um, but that's just some feedback, but overall really good presentation and uh, good job. Thanks, I really appreciate the feedback. <laughs> Thank you, Anatoly. Are there Are any there? other questions for the team? Thank you. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, Aura Blue. Thank you so much. Thanks for the Thank, you. Thank you, everybody. Perfect. So right now, uh, we'll be taking a 15 minute break and we will all return at 2.45 for the next presentation. So feel free to take a coffee break, washroom break, whatever you need to do. Um, but please stay on the webinar. Um, but you're welcome to, to turn off your camera and mic for now and then we'll return at 2.45. Thank you, everyone.
Perfect. So we have AI site ready to go, um, but I'll make sure the judges are all in before we begin. Okay, I think we can begin. Um, Kiana, you're welcome to start. Awesome. Hi, my name is Kiana Yateman. I am the founder and CEO of AI Site. We make everyday business operations smarter and more efficient by capturing real time insights using our affordable and easy to use computer vision video analytics solutions. Oops. Take a look at this frame. Can you spot all of the data that it all the data that could potentially add value to a business? Me neither. Good news is that there's a $4.1 billion computer vision industry that does. This industry helps businesses with efficiency processes, safety, foot traffic management, and more. Bad news is that we realize that this industry focuses on servicing large and public enterprises. The SMEs that could benefit from this technology are faced with significant barriers to adoption. This is because many current solutions require proprietary hardware and cameras. Some solutions have tried to service SMEs, but the implementation requires a per camera per month charge, what makes it difficult to deploy at scale. To make it worse, data processed under this implementation is stored in the cloud. This means that all company data that gets processed is not secure. This is where we come in. AI site is a next generation computer vision video analytics solution. We are focused on providing SMEs with actionable intelligence to make their operations smarter and more efficient. By connecting to any existing camera feed, AI site counts and detects objects in real time while providing users with real time actionable data and alerts. The AI site platform is also designed to send data to any existing business management software to assist with automation using the data collected. An example of this would be controlling a building's HVAC system according to occupancy. Unlike current solutions, AI site has an exclusive distributed computer under the hood. This allows us to eliminate the disadvantages of other video analytics platforms and enables a fast, affordable, secure, and scalable solution. Now, AI site's initial focus was working on people counting for foot traffic analytics. However, as the COVID-19 pandemic was beginning, I became aware of a serious problem in the agri-tech market. After months of hundreds of customer and industry interviews, combined with extensive market connections, we identified that this is the lowest hanging fruit for an initial vertical. We take egg supply chains from this to this. The average egg farmer spends eight hours a day manually counting eggs during collection. They require this information to track production, identify any changes that may signal malfunctions or disease, and set the speed of the supply conveyor belt according to packing capacity. This labor intensive process has a high price tag and makes it difficult to scale production. The biggest problem is that 5% of eggs get cracked due to improper belt speeds, which cause collisions. Farm management systems can accept egg count data from third-party devices to help control speeds. However, current devices have proven to be inaccurate and to not provide suggestions for corrective action. AI Site is developing the first smart egg counter to help farmers reduce cracked eggs and increase their margin. 
By connecting to video feeds along the egg supply belt, AI site tracks egg production by counting and detecting eggs in real time. The AI site system is designed to integrate with any existing automated management system to control the speed of the supply belts according to the amount of eggs we detect. By providing the existing systems with the only smart real-time data on the market, we'll re be reducing the amount of egg collisions, which reduces the amount of cracked eggs and food waste. With a modest 1% reduction, we estimate to generate each farm $85,000 a year in additional revenue. We also expect to save each farm $58,000 a year in salary and depreciating equipment expenses. We are excited to be working with one of Canada's larger egg farms, Grenier Poultry, to begin a six-month pilot to further develop and test our solution. Grenier Poultry produces upwards of 45 million eggs per year. They are currently willing to pay $5,000 a year. During this pilot, we will be evaluating the generated value and working on the value-based pricing model. We expect that this evaluation will increase the yearly fee to $20,000. This model will not only be profitable for AI site. Farmers are expected to see a yearly ROI of 617%. Based off our business model and a bottom-up approach, we've identified that there's a large market opportunity for this vertical alone. We have strong industry connections that will be beneficial as we penetrate this market. Since inception, we've had excellent traction, especially in the last nine months. For the first pilot of our technology, AI site was awarded a $60,000 grant for the development of a technology super cluster project. This successful project demonstrated that our technology has a 99.8% accuracy. In October, we signed an LOI with our first customer. Right now, we are about to begin the six-month pilot project with Grenier Poultry. It is set to be partially supported by a $50,000 grant. This project will be the stepping stone to commercialization. Now, we will begin commercialization through direct sales. We have two sales magicians lined up to hire in April of 2021. These hires will begin by focusing on the 400 egg farms in Ontario. As we begin to scale, we will begin licensing our technology to sales channel partners that currently sell the farm management system or other agri-tech solutions. We currently have expressed interest from two notable companies within this space. We have also identified a pipeline of 50 other possible partners. We will be competing with the current infrared egg counters on this market. We are confident that we will be competitive in this space due to the known accuracy issues and lack of corrective action demonstrated by these sensors. This problem was brought to our attention by Grenier Poultry and Maximus Solutions who are desperately seeking a new solution. Not only will we be competitive in the market, we are also confident that we will have a competitive moat in place to dominate this market. This includes leveraging a distributed computer for cost leadership while enhancing supply chain automation. First movers advantage because we are the first company applying AI to solve this problem and ease of integration because we are hardware and software agnostic. Farmers are actively seeking a solution and we are the first company coming to the table. The time is now and we need to act fast. We have built a founding team that can ensure the success of commercialization. Our strong technical background has allowed us to build the platform. We are excited to be filling an additional position next month and three more in April. Now, being first-time founders, we understand the importance of having a strong supporting team. We have carefully selected a team of partners and mentors to temporarily fill the gaps in specific areas. We project to onboard 50 farms by the end of 2021 and be servicing a total of 50 by the end of 2022. With these projections and a successful pre-seed round, we expect our monthly net profit to become positive in Q2 of 2022 we expect to break even by Q4 of 2022. Now, the egg counting vertical is just the beginning for AI site. We plan to expand to other egg tech verticals, including additional supply chain optimization and early detection of, exam of disease by detecting bird movement. From there, AI site will move into optimizing other manufacturing supply chains and then explore smart building and smart city initiatives. The opportunities for AI site are endless.
Today, we are asking for the opportunity for a $30,000 prize. We have just started a 300,000 pre-seed round and need $50,000 right now to match our pending grant and get the pilot with our first customer off the ground. This prize will go towards reaching our milestones and ensuring the future success of AI site. So today, I invite you to be part of our journey. Thank you. Perfect, thank you, Kiana. We can now move to questions from the judges. Kiana, that was great, thank you. Um, and I especially wanna um, point out your ask slide. I thought that was very well done and very clear thought through and laid out. Um, so the, the concept of machine vision in agri-tech is, uh, is not new. And I think you alluded to that as well, especially when it comes to disease identification as well. So um, I want to understand how you narrowed in on uh, eggs as your lowest hanging fruit. So talk to us about some of the additional verticals you researched prior to that. And then I also wanna hear on your team, who is the machine vision um, and, um, uh, and data science skill set? Yeah, of course. So basically when I started AI say, as I mentioned, I was working on foot traffic analytics and also car counting analytics. And the problem, no, it's not that it was a problem, but what I found with those verticals is that I was kind of dealing with cities, which made it a super bureaucratic process. And those verticals are not off the table whatsoever, but being a startup, we need to get into a market as soon as possible and get paying customers as soon as possible. And if we want to do that, we can't be working with municipalities or police stations or anything like that. We've been approached by New York City, the city of Kingston, the York Police Department to do foot traffic analytics and car analytics, but it just doesn't make sense for us right now. And the fact we have this opportunity with egg farmers who are seeking the solution. Um, and as you mentioned, I know that AI, AI is not new in the agri-tech field whatsoever. It's been up and coming, especially purchases in farming. What is new about AI for us is the fact we're using it for egg counting because over the years it's to do egg counting, they've only used sensors. And as I mentioned, these sensors don't work. So farmers have stopped using them altogether. So their eggs are cracking, they have no solution. And when they're sending the eggs to Burn Bay Farms, for example, in Ontario, which are like the egg processors, who box them and send them off to the restaurants and grocery stores, they're losing so much money because these are the people who pay them and they don't pay them for the cracked eggs. And farmers obviously don't get a pay paid enough as it is. They feed everyone on this planet. So they deserve to have their margin bigger and make as much money as possible. Um, quick question. So just so, yeah. so basically you've got this computer vision uh, it scans the situation, analyzes what's happening, and the the call to action is slowing down or speeding up the conveyor belt, or is there additional things you can do besides that? Yeah, so the main part is connecting to a third-party API using the farm management system to help slow down and speed up the belts, which will reduce collisions and thus egg breakages. But what we also do is we keep the data in our secure web-based platform which helps farmers track production. And they need these production counts to obviously for, for planning, and then also to detect any malfunctions or disease within their supply chain. Because as soon as the egg count goes down, they know that there's a problem and they need to fix it. And disease is especially like the most important for them because if there's a disease in just one chicken, it can spread to the other chickens so fast because they have about 50 to 60,000 chickens all together at the same time. Very interesting. And that's just wipe out the entire farm. That's very interesting, actually. Have you um, tested this and actually seen real results, or is this still in theory mode? Yeah, so basically, as I mentioned, that we were working on other verticals. So we've tested our platform using other verticals, like specifically with the foot traffic analytics. We were actually involved in a $2.3 million project for physical distance monitoring and basically using that we are just able to test like the accuracy of our solution mm -hmm. but testing the specific eggs in general that is with the six month pilot project where we were beginning with Grenier and we're ex like given our previous re results we expect that to go very well and then that's when we have our sales channel partners in line to start adopting and helping so us sell you haven't you haven't done the pilot yet you're about to start one or you have done the pilot it's in progress and then you 
have already realized some cost savings? Like help me understand where you actually yeah. are. So basically the cost savings that we were able to figure out were using the egg farms, financial statements, the records of egg breakages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the pilot we have done was just with our technology in general to test the actual egg counting solution and further develop and optimize it. That's what we're starting in February with Grenier poultry. Got it. So technically, theoretically, it might not work. You don't have um, any sort of data to show that it does work. Um, well, given our data from our previous pilots, like that's what shows it works. The only thing we're doing is retraining it to count eggs, which takes about three days to do. Um, everyone we've talked to in terms of like AI intelligence, are, they're very confident it's going to work. So I, I have no doubt that you can count the eggs. I'm just talking about the uh, actually having an impact on less breakages and also being able to identify disease just from the egg itself. But that has not been proven yet. Yeah, so we're not actually identifying disease from the egg itself. The way that disease is identified is when their production of eggs goes up or down. So, for example, if they're producing upwards of 5,000 eggs a day, and then all of a sudden that goes to 3,000 eggs a day, that means that there's a problem. So the first thing they need to look at is their supply chain. So say if there's like a little like part of the machine that's broken, and then if that doesn't, they send the vet in to start testing the chickens. Don't they so count the eggs? Don't they count the eggs already because that's kind of how they get paid? Yeah, so that's what they're doing manually. So by using AI to do this for them, they don't have to do it manually, which is awesome. Like that's what they're looking to do because they, they literally have someone sitting there eight hours a day, 365 days a year, manually counting eggs, and they don't have time to be doing that. So that's where this comes in for them. And all the farmers we've talked to are super excited about this technology. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I'm I'm trying to I, I'm trying to figure out a little bit like how big this problem is and how it plays into our Canadian system. Like, don't we have and and I'm dangerously a little bit of knowledge about this, which is like, don't we have a quota system for eggs in Canada? And how yeah. how does this technology play into helping them make more or less if we have a quota system? Yeah, hey, so hey, farmers hey, do hey, produce. Hey, oh, good, farmers good. do produce uh, based on the quota system. But the problem is that these eggs are still breaking. So for example, if Grenier poultry right now has a quota of 45 million eggs, five, they're trying to produce that 45 million, but 5% of those eggs are breaking, which means Grenier poultry itself is losing $400,000 a year in revenue based on the quota they're producing. And that $400,000 means a lot to these farmers. So if they can get that $400,000 back, they will do anything to ensure that will happen. So their quota is on before they count the broken eggs or after yeah. they count the broken eggs? Yeah, so that's before they count the broken eggs. So for example, if we're solving that 5% breakage, they could actually start producing 5% more. You can size, it's size on farm. Um, I'm a little bit dangerous in this area too. I have a question, Ken, about this. Uh, yeah. Back to market, to build on this around market segmentation, you said, so you're getting nice interest from farmers, but um, there's different scales of farming, right? So, so you, so have you taken this down further to understand what the true addressable market is? Just wondering. Yeah, yeah. So basically, the true addressable market is the market that we are able to serve, and those are farms that are producing more than 10 million eggs per year. I know that sounds like a lot, but it actually isn't whatsoever. As I mentioned, Grenier um, produces 45 million. Um, so there's actually 235,000 egg farms in the United States, but we were, we were able to identify the 19,000 that we're able to serve, and that's included in the market opportunity slide I presented to you. Okay. Yeah. And farmers, my other question is just around adoption. So there's a, pro yeah. a problem, but farmers, um, they like their animals. I'll put it that way. So, so they, they value their visual inspection and what they do. So. Can you, so what's, what, what, what do you see as the, I guess, the adoption curve and what it takes to convert farmers to, you said, you said everyone you've talked to, but have you got a sense of utility and how much, how much adoption will happen to these solutions? Yeah, it's actually really interesting because every single farmer I've talked to, and I've talked to about hundreds at this point, every single one is willing to adopt this technology because as I said, they were using technology like this before, but it was just sensors and not AI. Like this technology is integrated with all of their systems. So I'm just taking something that already existed. Some of them have stopped using because it certain actually created more breakages.
and just optimizing it and making it more efficient and better. And also more cost efficient because before, like our competitors, they require these really extensive legacy systems. And to get all of this hardware in the farm, it costs about $65,000 upfront. And farmers don't have that money. Like they, ha they need to put their money into making more barns or making like their, their animals better because that's what they care about. So by providing this for them, it's e the easiest integration and adoption for them. And that's our goal is to make everything easy for them, but also help them make more money. Uh, so uh, a couple of quick comments. Uh, so I, I, I like the practicality of the solution to something uh, anybody who's not a vegan probably uses every day or a couple times a week. Uh, farmers are an underserved community to a large extent. And, and I think this is a, a, a useful tool. I also like what I what you call the low hanging fruit pivot, uh, going Thank from uh, uh, car tracking or or people tracking to uh, how to use this to count eggs. Uh, uh, is there unique IP here that uh, you control? Um. Okay. So basically, in the realm of AI and video analytics, this isn't something we can patent. Um. It's something we keep a trade secret. I've talked to a bunch of patent agents and lawyers and the best way to go about it is keeping it a trade secret and then also copywriting any proprietary code that we produce. And we are confident in that sort of protection that we have. Ken, I wanna ask you a question about your market. And so, right, you said you pivoted, you talked about smart cities. I do a lot of work with municipalities. That's exactly where I went at the beginning of the presentation. Then you went to eggs. And I'm wondering though, is the application for this beyond egg farmers? Like is the yes. actual market not just how many egg farms there are in North America, but where else are you like where else could this be used? I'm just having a hard time imagining what the usage for this could be. Yeah. Of course. So as I said, the opportunities for this technology are actually endless, especially because what we have built is based on a modular code which means we can easily retrain it with no really extra cost or anything to use it for a different application. So our first kind of objective after we like figure out this egg counting thing and really start penetrating the market is looking at other agri-food and other like ag tech kind of um, applications and then moving into other manufacturing supply chains. And then once we really get good at what we're doing, that's when we want to start penetrating those smart city and smart buildings applications. As I said, I've had interest from New York City, City of Kingston, New York Police for these actual smart city applications. But as I said, it's a very bureaucratic, bureaucratic process. And to make sure we're getting a startup off the ground, that is something that's in our three to four, five year view rather than the immediate kind of call to action. So from a like strategy perspective, you're talking about egg farmers because they, they can make decisions quickly. Can you give me one other example of agri-food like the egg people yeah. could make? Yeah, of course. So that could be looking at like the production of other food and like analyzing that on the production line and counting it. And then also looking at birds themselves because basically you can look, so using AI, you can detect movement of their animals and see if they're acting weird and that would signal disease which is really important. Oxford actually did a big study of it in 2012 and no one's really done anything with that, especially in the terms of chickens. So farmers are really excited to see where this can go once we start helping them with just eggs themselves. But, but it also again, can say that it could also be cattle. Yeah, it could be cattle, it could be pigs, it could literally be anything. So what I'm excited to do is work with our investors and our mentors to really narrow down the strategic path of where we'd like to go after we start commercializing it with just eggs. Thank you. What's, yeah, no problem. I guess on that point though, kind of, I missed it if you, what is the specific IP or specific know-how or algorithm? Like what is it specifically that this does uniquely? You're yeah, of course. So like I said, um, the, uh, like the AI computer vision industry, like you can't, you can't patent the IP. All you can do is make a pr proprietary code that no one else has and keep it a trade secret and copyright any code that is proprietary. 
So that's what we've done and we're very confident with it. And as I mentioned before, we've talked to lawyers, various patent agents, and that's what we've really narrowed down in terms of the IP. And we're confident that we'll, we'll keep that as a competitive moat as well. But is there something about the, you pivoted on, app, on market applications, which is, which is really yeah. something you know, um, and obviously saw a need for around eggs. But is there something that makes your AI, your, your AI uniquely suited? For yeah, eggs? yeah. So basically kind of what I mentioned at the beginning is that there's problems with other computer vision solutions. And I'm gonna dive into a little bit of this, but stop me if it's getting confusing because it's kind of technical. So these companies either use something called edge computing or cloud computing. Edge computing is secure, but it's very, very expensive. Usually just governments or large corporations use it. And then the other SMEs that they've tried to kind of service, but have completely failed for the most part, use cloud computing, which again, as I mentioned, gets stored in the cloud, not secure, next to impossible to scale because of a per camera per month charge. So what's underneath our hood is an exclusive distributed computer, which is distributed computing, which is a mix of cloud computing and edge computing. We're able to use the computing of de existing devices on the farm to power our AI. No other company in Canada has access to this distributed computer. We have an exclusive agreement with our partner company to be using this distributed computer which makes us much more cost effective and also just better in general due to the scalability and security of our AI. And that's something that, it, that was kind of our first competitive advantage I mentioned. That is the most important thing I think we have going for us in terms of being unique for the AI. I hope that made sense. I think we have time for one more question and I see a question in the chat, Kiana, from Prathma. I'll just- Oh, I, I can't oh. see it. Sorry, so, Kiana, I'm just wondering, do you have a technical co-founder or a CTO? Yeah, so I do have, so basically what I've done is because I was obviously a student and I wanted to keep um, overhead low, I have a technical co-founder that I've been contracting. His name is Hamada Gazmala. He has about 10 to 12 years of AI experience. He is, honestly an AI magician and I don't know how he does it. And what I, what's great is he's also over the course of my pilot project, he's helping me on board this guy named David who goes to Mila. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Mila, but is the AI Institute in Montreal. So basically I have my current CTO who's going to be onboarding our full-time CTO over the course of the next six months. I'm really excited. They're both the smartest people I've ever met. So I think they're gonna be doing some great things for AI site. Wonderful. And then back to Anatoly's original question, when do you expect to start seeing some initial results or, or data points from your uh, first pilot? Yeah, of course. So we should be getting those within month two to three of our pilot project. So given that we get the funding and get like are able to match the grant, we should be seeing results in April, May, which I'm really excited to see as well. And I'd be happy to share those with anyone if they're interested in the future. Great. Thank you so much, Kiana. I think that's all the time we have for questions. Awesome. Um, Thanks everyone for their time. Oh, great. Thank, thank you. Awesome. Very much. Yeah, no problem. Judges, if you check the chat, uh, there's a link to our executive summary. Very good. A global pandemic, economic crisis, inequalities, and climate change have pushed brands to the forefront of societal change. Consumers expect that brands will act on issues that, that affect their lives. Hello, my name is Li Ju Huang, and with me is Rod Chatterjee, and together we are co-founders of Meaningful Work, an innovative employee volunteer management solution for companies looking to expand their corporate purpose. It's simply not enough for brands to issue a statement or make an emotional ad. This is a quote from Edelman, the largest PR firm in the world. 
Instead, brands need to shift to social purpose to meet their organization's internal and external demands. Did you know 87% of consumers would rather purchase from a company that supports issues that they care about? And furthermore, 88% of the next generation of employees would rather choose to work at an organization that aligns with their values and has a strong CSR program. And one of the most efficient ways to improve organizational purpose is to build an employee volunteer program by providing paid volunteer time, matching donations, and, rec and recognizing employee contributions. While it may be one of the best forms of corporate give back programs, it's simply, it's painfully executed through unorganized Excel sheets, for example. Volunteer managers face themselves with a time consuming and labor intensive task to source opportunities and match their employees then finding themselves trying to figure out how to calculate the ROI of the program. In spite of this growing movement and corporate volunteerism, it's simply too expensive. Companies like TELUS spends over $2 million to source nonprofit opportunities to reach their annual goal of 1 million hours donated. And companies like BD work with university research teams on measuring their annual impact. And we know not all companies can afford that. And that's where we come in. We're meaningful work. Our platform enables employees to give what they're good at by matching their skills and passions to nonprofit projects. And nonprofits love this because they're always tight on staff and operational funding. And you as a volunteer manager can collect your employee impact stories and data, giving you the ability to market how your organization gives back and report back to your stakeholders. And by having your employees already built the relationships with the nonprofits, the next time your organization wants to give back monetarily, you'll already have a list of trusted partners. Through our smart volunteer management platform, companies can filter through a directory of thousands of nonprofit opportunities, connect employees and teams to meaningful projects and advising, and track and measure employee volunteer hours and impact. Our platform's key features include meaningful match and volunteer analytics, matching your employees to ideal opportunities and aligning, and, and aligning your company's purpose with their values. We highlight your employees' community engagement through stories and combine with the integrated impact measurement based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Through our integrated donation system, you can enable your employees to give back to nonprofits that matter most to them through your donation matching program. And companies love meaningful work because of the key features, but also the benefits. Employees can engage in skill development by developing new and old skills while being exposed to new environments, new challenges, and all while doing good work in their local communities. And this helps increase engagement and retention rates, which generates more than $2,400 of value per employee volunteer through increased engagement and reduced turnover. And through the stories you tell and the impact you deliver, it strengthens your company's brand value. At the end of the day, research shows that companies with a strong employee volunteer program leads towards a stronger bottom line. Engaged employees have three times the operating margin and four times their earnings per share compared to companies with low engagement. Now I'll pass it on to my co-founder, Raj, to talk about our business model. Thanks, Liju. By speaking to over 100 companies, we've arrived at three customer segments. B Corps have a commitment to social responsibility, but lack a tech solution for their volunteer program. Tech companies suffer from the highest turnover rates and see volunteer programs as a way to improve employer branding. Professional service firms volunteer to build community connections and benefit from greater local awareness. Our key influencers at these companies are also our primary users. These include HR, community, and marketing managers who generally administer volunteer programs. So you're probably wondering, how do we make money? Our business model has two sources of revenue. Companies are our primary source of revenue with an annual subscription of $50 per employee. Nonprofits are a secondary source with a freemium model to ensure a minimum barrier to entry while charging $500 annually for premium features like unlimited postings and multiple accounts. Just focusing on our primary revenue model for companies with over 50 employees, our total addressable market in Canada and the US is valued at $5 billion. Our market considering our primary customer segments is valued at $500 million per year and growing. And our serviceable and obtainable market by 2023 is $1.5 million, which consists of 100 mid to large size companies. We estimate a recurring deal size of $15,000 for a company with 300 employees, and there are approximately 40,000 similarly sized businesses in North America. We only need to capture 100 of these companies for a break even at $1.5 million of annual re recurring revenue. By leveraging the incredible talent of corporate employees, we'll be able to create a sizable impact in our communities. With 100 companies representing 30,000 employees, we can support 8,000 nonprofits. This translates to a million hours annually and $100 million in value for nonprofits. 
we'll be able to share 150,000 impact stories showing contributions to each of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Meaningful work will engage three times more employees at each company, saving on average $375,000 through increased retention alone. And we will process $9 million in donations to nonprofits and charities, empowering them to accelerate execution on their vision. Our competitors include the market leader Benevity, Catch a Fire, and GoodUp. However, they don't solve the problems that volunteer managers face. Catch a Fire does not offer an integrated company platform and charges a prohibitive price for small nonprofits. Meanwhile, Benevity's platform struggles to find skill-based opportunities for individuals and teams because they don't work closely enough with nonprofits. We have pilot clients who use Benevity on a daily basis, but have told us that meaningful work is the highest value and most cost-effective solution for skill-based volunteering. Our solution provides instant access to meaningful opportunities, engages both individuals and teams, and has the most comprehensive impact measurement and sharing capabilities. Finally, if you're a medium-sized business in Canada, we're the only option for you on this list. Our go-to-market strategy requires building awareness through key partnerships with business and nonprofit networks. We'll display thought leadership on the future of corporate purpose through blogs, workshops, and trainings, and we'll make adoption easy through live demos and one-month trials. Our team came together as award-winning community leaders working to build a sustainable future. We have years of combined experience on charity boards, working on federal and provincial policies, designing successful products, and leading environmental initiatives at top software companies. Our team of advisors support us with the direction and industry knowledge that we need to succeed in sales, marketing, impact, and product development. We're a company that's less than a year old, but we've made rapid progress. Moving from our initial idea in the February of 2020 to launching our uh, pilot volunteer matching service in June. After the success of our pilot, we moved on to hiring key talent and launching a beta web application in December. We plan to capture our first paying customer in March and validate our pricing and release our full product in the June of 2021. To date, we have 10 companies and 30 nonprofits who are piloting our product with more on the way as our beta community grows. We've integrated feedback from companies that excel in the space like TELUS and Traction on Demand, and we've been developing partnerships with boards of trade and nonprofit networks like the Vantage Point to expand our reach. Our product has rounded support from grants and competitions to a sum of $150,000, but has enabled us to hire three full-time developers and four co-op students in addition to our founding team. If we win the $40,000 prize, we'll be able to hire two amazing developers to accelerate our full future set. Additionally, we're, we're currently seeking mentorship in sales and marketing to reach our goal of five paying customers by June. We're also seeking mentorships in design and software development to ensure a successful product. 2021 is a year of purpose, the year where we rebuild for a sustainable future. Help us support companies in creating outstanding impact. My name is Raj. This is Liju. We're from Meaningful Work. Thank you for listening. It's a great presentation, um, Raj and Liju. I, I guess my first question is on platform, knowing that you're connecting uh, companies as well to obviously uh, target uh, benefactors or not, not for profits. Do you guys have a sense of what that community looks like, needs to look like in terms of numbers or folks on the platform to drive traction that you guys need on the, on the corporate side that makes them think that you, you're serving enough of the employees needs and what they want to look, see for. Totally. Um, we've come to a ratio of approximately for a company of 300 um, of 80 nonprofits to support the employees that um, in order to provide enough variety of opportunities for each individual employee's um, passions to be satisfied, um, as well as skills. So that's sort of the ratio we're working with right now based on our estimates and talking to customers. Um, and it's, it's, it'll, it'll work it's out that way because nonprofits are much easier to reach and we can, we've been having a really successful marketing uh, funnel to reach them, uh, whereas sales are, uh, companies are more through um, the sales um, process instead. And it's about a three month sales cycle. On the, on the not-for-profit side, so you have to find the not-for-profits to participate in this too, right? Yeah, we also- so we, how, how, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So, so how, How's that been going and what do, what do they actually need, right? Like I, I work with some not-for-profits and having people parachute in to provide a certain skill is not necessarily help 
helpful if, if they're just parachuting in. Um, often, you know, like Habitat for Humanity, if you go and sign up to, to help build a house, like you actually, they're looking for your donation. They're not actually really looking for, you know, your work that day, although that is helpful. They're looking for that donation that goes along with that, right? So how does that all work? And, and, and how do not-for-profits see the value in this? Yeah, totally. Um, so, yeah, we, we speak to non not for profits on, on a daily basis. And the primary things that nonprofits are looking for, um, let me switch here, is, is really lack of resources in digital and operational strategy. Um, we have a, a number of non -for, not for profits uh, who are smaller. Uh, they really don't, don't know how to take advantage of all the grants that are out there to um, hire for, you know, marketing co ops and um, all of that, and and they really just need, um, and for one, strategic advising that we offer for on our platform. Um, and I'll just give you an example um, that might be easier of in our impact story. So we had a couple of nonprofits, um, smaller ones in environmental um, and social initiatives, and we paired them with professionals at uh, Sage uh, Foundation, and they were able to provide them with um, consulting in in HR and really um, in improve their. Um, volunteer recruitment process uh, and switching from in-person to online, um, as well as provide digital marketing uh, experience. Like a lot of nonprofits have resources, um, like discounts to ads, but they just don't know how to use them because they don't have that expertise specifically. They're more focused on, on their impact, especially smaller nonprofits. Um, so a variety of HR, marketing, um, business development are some of the key um, problems that we've identified nonprofits facing. Um, and finally, we just offer uh, templates. So projects, non-profits uh, can kind of choose a template that they want to uh, choose of a, pro uh, of a, of a project, um, whether that be digital marketing advising or a digital marketing project, uh, for example. And um, it's easy for them to upload it. And it, it helps them to, to, to put out their request themselves so they actually benefit from what they're getting. Have you guys um, worked with Salesforce? Salesforce Philanthropy Cloud? Um, we haven't worked with uh, the Philanthropy Cloud. We did look into it. Um, you did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm just thinking it's similar in terms of identifying volunteer needs. It lists all the, you know, I sign up for it with my company, all my, my staff were on there. We can do our any cash volunteering, money donating on there, plus all the, as it uses all that AI to tell me then what where I can volunteer. So how does this, maybe what's different about this than, than that? Totally. Um, so the difference between um, what Salesforce is that they are um, targeting larger companies and those companies are ones that have many nonprofit partners that are specific to that one company. So they'll ask nonprofits to sign up to their Salesforce portal. Um, and it's really inefficient for nonprofits to have to post to multiple portals um, and Essentially, it's more of a white labeled solution, whereas we're more of a community marketplace. Um, and that makes it a much easier for a new company starting up to just uh, create a, um, an account and then have instant access to all the opportunities without having to already have those nonprofit connections. I would just check out your understanding of that just a little bit. I Sure. Yeah. OK. And have you ever worked with the Social Purpose Institute through the United Way? Totally. Yeah, we just had a conversation with Coro um, the yeah. other day, and and she was pretty excited. Um, she re recommended us to go out to some of the larger um, business purpose uh, networks in Canada, um, and um, yeah, she was excited about the product for sure. Yeah. Okay. Because I do feel that there might be you might be helpful to them, and they to you just from a finding yeah. interested organizations. Okay. Thank you. So guys, good job. Um, I just have two quick, sorry, Peter. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, one on your team, I'm wondering, so in your business plan, I, I think I saw something like a team of 14 and then maybe now you said 10. I'm wondering at this stage why you need so many people. Um, totally. What we, what we have in our team is primarily um, developers and designers. Um, we want to, we're a tech company and we really benefit from having the, the marketing side um, and the sales side really inform our tech. Um, so as a, instead of uh, outsourcing our um, tech development, we've actually developed it in-house. 
Um, and we believe that's that's an advantage for us. Um, we also have been able to take advantage of a lot of um, hiring grants that has enabled us to do this without uh, much cost. Okay, very good. And then on pricing, I was wondering, um, you have some, you have about 10 or so beta clients. Um, have you tested pricing with them at all? Uh, any feedback on that $50 per employee price point? Mm, totally. Uh, yeah, so we have. And um, $50 is sort of something that they are comfortable paying. It's not too low for them. Or it's not like they, they're super uh, thrilled that it's like, so cheap, but um, it's, it's actually reflective of the value that we provide. That's, that's the feedback that we got. And it's not a, a, too much above their budget that they can afford. Could I ask another question? You, could you just go back to who you said the market was, the size of the companies you feel that you're going after and the number of employees you feel that they would have? Totally. Um, this can pop up there. Um, yeah, so here's the market size. Um, so looking at the companies, uh, employees from 50 employees up and particularly our ideal customer right now would be a company with 300 employees. Um, yeah. So, so I fit into this puzzle as an employer uh, and we have a very strong philanthropic bent with very specific things that we tend to fund. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to figure out how, what you're doing overlays with what I do now. So what I feel I'm hearing is employees can go and get engaged Did you as an employer get the benefit of their engagement in the multitudes of ways they want to engage whereas as an employer i'm saying i'm contributing say a half a million dollars a year in philanthropic money to various causes or to three specific causes that we're trying to support what i want to do is engage my people in a way that supports those philanthropic endeavors maybe not in a national scale or in a, in, 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 a, in a provincial scale, but maybe in their local scale. How do I overlay, how do I, uh, how do I connect those two dots? Like, I'm, totally. I don't, I don't want to, I, I shouldn't say I don't want. I, if an employee comes and says, I want to go and do this, I want to say, good for you. But if they come and say, well, I want to do this in this space, I want to say, well, if you do it in that space, then that provides a lever for us in the way that we do other things. So uh, how do I encourage an outcome that I'm trying to drive as a business with my philanthropic dollars? Totally. That's does that, a great question. Does that make sense? I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not sure yeah. that's getting it across, but that, that's clear. Totally. Um, so w when companies sign up, they're able to select the key impact areas that they want to work on. Okay. Um, and companies can even filter by nonprofits that their employees can actually volunteer with as well if they would like that feature. Um, additionally, you can also see the trends that your employees are giving time towards and donating towards, and that can also potentially help align your employees' um, interests with the values of your company as well. Are there any other questions for me, Warwick? Yeah, I'd have another one. Um, it's not super critical. <laughs> I noticed on your business plan, you had mention of Golden Ventures there for fair market pricing or something. I'm wondering if you can explain that. Oh, sorry, do you mind just repeating that? Yeah, I, I think I noticed on your business plan, you had mention of Golden Ventures for fair market pricing or something like that. Uh, I'm wondering if you remember that and can speak to it. It wasn't, you didn't talk about it in your deck. It was in, in the plan that you had submitted previously. Oh, Golden golden Ventures? Yes. Um, Lydia, do, you, do you mind touching on that? No worries if it doesn't continue. I, I think I think um, I may have touched on that in, in, in speaking in terms of like uh, potential to scale, um, but to be quite honest with you, I don't quite uh, remember it in specifics. So 
So if all, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you so much, Meaningful Work, for presenting. And I think we'll wrap up uh, the event here. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to thank again all six teams uh, for delivering your presentations. I think the judges were definitely impressed by some of the ideas that were presented. Um, and I hope the viewers at home um, also enjoyed watching the presentations. I know I certainly did. Um, and thank you again for the judges for providing those insightful questions for our competitors, uh, making sure they're thinking on their feet um, and providing that insightful feedback. And for now, the competitors and viewers are more than welcome to hop up to hop off to our next event. Um, you, you do have a bit of time, you have half an hour. Uh, we have an exciting workshop from Interface Design starting at 4.30. Um, so feel free to hop off the webinar now and join the, the workshop at 4.30 p.m. As for the judges, you should have received an email from me containing a Zoom link where you can hop off this webinar and enter a private um, judging briefing room where you can deliberate the results. Let me know if you receive that email um, and then you're more than welcome to leave. Thank you. Well done, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Well done. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>